have the uh, great pleasure of introducing this morning's keynote speaker, Scott Reckler. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Scott is the Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of RXR Realty LLC, a multi-billion dollar private real, real estate company which uh, was formed subsequent to the merger of Rex and Associates Realty Corp with SL Green Realty Corp, one of the uh, largest public real estate management buyout, uh, buyouts uh, in REIT history. While serving as Chief Executive Officer and Chairman uh, of the Board of Rexon, Scott's vision and leadership guided Rexon through the company's years of growth throughout Long Island, New Jersey, New York City, Westchester, and Connecticut, overseeing in excess of $6 billion in acquisitions, developments, and is now managing over, uh, is managing over 20 million square feet of commercial uh, property in the tri-state area. Scott was also the architect of Rex, Rexon's successful uh, IPO back in 1995. During Scott's tenure at Rexon from 1989 until January of 2007, he served as president, co-chief executive officer, and a member of the Rexon board of directors, as well as chairman of the board's executive committee. Scott is the chairman and chief executive officer of RNY Property Trust, a public real estate company listed on the Australian Securities Exchange. Should have been on the island, so Scott, that's okay. Uh, he's also actively involved with the Real Estate uh, Roundtable, where he is a member of the uh, Board of Directors and co-chair of its Political Action Committee. In addition, Scott serves as a board uh, member for the Association for a Better Long Island and the Association for a Better New York. Scott is a member of the Hofstra Honors College Advisory Committee, uh, as well as a member of the NYU Real Estate Institute Advisory Committee. Scott also serves on the board of the Tribeca Film Institute, the Long Island Children's Museum as well, where he serves as its co-chairman of the board. Uh, as you know, Scott is also a big supporter of Long Island uh, and Nassau County. In particular, as we know, has been working very hard and closely with Charles Wong uh, as his partner in the Lighthouse Project. Hopefully the Lighthouse Project will receive approval shortly and will help our Long Island community grow. We wish Scott all the best in that effort. It's in everyone's best interest. And we know. Um, <laughs> and obviously, we know it would be another one of the extremely successful projects which Scott and his team will complete. Uh, with that, please join me now in giving Scott a warm welcome again to Hofstra. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rich. I appreciate uh, you, you both kicking this off for me. And uh, uh, Nancy White, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for that great endorsement on the Lighthouse Project. Hopefully by the time I'm done with my presentation, you can see why it's so important uh, for Long Island. Um, actually, a year ago or so, I was at Hofstra at another uh, event that uh, I thought was an extraordinary event talking about the, uh, the financial crisis and had a great group of speakers. And similar to today, uh, there was a, a real lack of clarity as to what the, the future holds. And I thought that the uh, opportunity to listen to so many different voices share their perspective uh, helped a lot of us gain some clarity as we were going through the turbulent times. And I hope to provide some of that uh, insight today, at least from, from my perspective. And uh, I congratulate Hofstra on being a leader of bringing some of the, uh, the key thought leaders uh, together to share their perspective and having events like this uh, on a regular basis. It's great for Hofstra, great for Long Island and great for the, uh, the business community uh, as a whole. So thank you for, uh, for having me. Well, let, let me tell you what I would like to try to do and, and how I sort of put some uh, thoughts together. First, I'm just going to share a little bit of background uh, on, on uh, RxR and, and what we're doing so you have a sense as to where I gain uh, my perspective from uh, very quickly. Uh, then give you some general thoughts as to where we see uh, the U.S. economy right now in terms of where it is uh, in its cycle and how it impacts the commercial uh, real estate uh, market specifically and some of the challenges that the commercial real estate market's going through and will be going through over the years to come. I then want to bring that back and, and try to share some views of how that's going to impact our region, specifically Manhattan, uh, which is the epicenter of a lot of this crisis, and then uh, Long Island, uh, since that ties into uh, to many people here and a lot of things that we're working on. And then I'll be open for any, uh, any Q&A. Uh, than anyone might have. Um, so just uh, starting 
with just a little background about RxR. Uh, Sal did a great job of giving some of my, my details there, so I'm not going to go through it in, in too much detail, but as Sal said, we sold our company, uh, Rexin, which we took public in 1995 for $300 million. We grew that company uh, through 2007 and sold it in January uh, 25th, 2007 for six and a half billion dollars to a company called uh, SL Green. And the primary driver uh, of selling the company at the time was you really saw uh, an incredible speculative bubble building in the real estate market. After going many, many years of being able to be an active uh, investor and acquire properties and getting uh, proper risk adjusted returns, we saw that the rationale for where things were trading in terms of pricing uh, became out of whack. Uh, just to give you a feel, as we look back, we sort of think that the first quarter of, of 2006 was sort of when the commercial real estate market hit a state of equilibrium, both on the rental rates that people were able to charge, as well as the sales prices when buildings uh, were clearing. Um, subsequent to the first quarter of 2006, there was a speculative bubble that developed. And actually, in Manhattan, as an example, we saw rents climb from the first quarter of 06 to uh, the end of 2007, 70%. Asking rents climbed 70%. Same thing for prices per foot of real estate, jumped 70%. So when you see that type of steep speculative curve coming your way, it, it's an indicator that things are overheated and uh, you shouldn't be a buyer, you should be a seller, which uh, uh, was what we did, and we had some great advice from our board of directors, Lou and Ari, who was also a speaker here last year, uh, and a big Hofstra supporter, as on our board, and others that lived through this cycle, recognized that pattern, and ultimately, uh, we chose uh, to sell the company. Now, our focus has historically uh, been in the New York Tri-State area, uh, as, as Sal said, so the perspective that we have, really, is from talking to uh, business leaders, uh, real estate professionals, uh, in this area and get a sense as to what's happening uh, in this marketplace. And while we expected the market to, uh, to, to come down and, and, and uh, uh, sort of see, you see it peaking, obviously we didn't uh, have an expectation uh, that the crash would be as deep uh, and as painful as ultimately what happened uh, in 2008 and into 2009. Um, this has been clearly more than a cyclical downturn. There were a lot of structural uh, economic elements that that has driven this, and I think the, uh, the government and some of their activities uh, did a good job of, of bailing us out from having uh, what could have been a very prolonged uh, state of depression, and instead have just left us with the worst economic downturn since the last depression in, in the 1930s. And I think a lot of the euphoria that one feels uh, today when they look at the markets, et cetera, is just that. It's just a comparison as to what it could have been. There was an expectation for the first time in many years that we actually might fall into a great state of depression. And then we got bailed out from that. And so there was a sense of, uh, on a comparative basis, it feels good. But when you really cut through it all, uh, from my perspective at least, I think uh, this, this sort of V-shaped recovery that one might uh, believe is happening out there is a head fake, uh, and a lot of that euphoria that, that uh, is being felt out there is really not founded uh, in the fundamentals uh, of the business environment, the business community, at least the people that I speak to uh, on, on a regular basis. So, you know, as I look at this, uh, this current marketplace, I think there's a uh, sort of a false sense of, um, of, of euphoria, and it's unsustainable. Um, you know, you had a period of time where, and going back a year uh, from, let's say, November all the way through the beginning, middle, of the second quarter, where everyone put every big decision on hold. You weren't buying any capital goods, you weren't leasing any space, you weren't planning vacations, you were canceling everything you could possibly cancel. And so you had this, this complete stopping of the economy. What we've seen now is the unwinding of that. We've seen the inventory replenishing. We've seen people come out and have to make decisions that they were able to defer to try to get a grasp of what's happening uh, in the world. They can't defer them any longer so now they're moving forward uh, with those decisions. You're seeing some of the benefits of the fiscal stimulus, the tax incentives that has driven, again, uh, some people back to the marketplace. But I'm not sure that's sustainable. And when you look at the levels of activity, clearly I don't believe the levels are sustainable. That you're seeing, you know, if you watch the greatest is, is the cash for clunkers uh, plan with the, the, the government put in place. People were then buying cars and then all of a sudden retail sales went up, cash for clunkers expires, and now car sales are back down. And so you, know, you could see the same thing happening in housing, where there's an $8,000 tax credit that expires in November. 
that's going to you know it's drive people first time home buyers to buy homes. Uh, that's going to expire unless the government extends that. If that doesn't get extended, my guess is you're going to see housing sales again and the, the rate of housing sales uh, come back down. The other thing is you had the Federal Reserve pump an enormous amount of liquidity uh, into the marketplace. And that liquidity itself has enabled uh, assets values to appreciate every asset, whether that's uh, bonds, whether that's uh, you know, corporate bonds. Obviously, the equity markets have gone up because of that, that large level of liquidity uh, that's been in the marketplace. And my belief is that those markets have gotten ahead of themselves. And as the government tries to pull back some of that liquidity, uh, where is it going to stand? So the V-shape is not one that I'm a believer in uh, long term. My, my view, in my opinion, really is more of we're sort of what I call that extended square root, which is sort of we went down, came back a little, and now we're going to sort of go out like an L straight out there for quite some time and sort of bounce along the bottom for a number of years as consumer and businesses repair their balance sheets. And that, to me, is probably the more likely uh, scenario, which means that, you know, as everything you look at, there's not going to be material growth. There's not going to be material uh, employment growth. There's not going to be um, material consumer activity. And when you're watching earnings today uh, that are really being driven by cost reductions, uh, that's what's going to have to continue. Uh, and once that one-time cost reduction is taken out of the system, uh, you're not going to really have the revenue top line of growth to match it, at least in the way that we look at things uh, going forward. And if you look historically, and, and one of the reasons that uh, I feel strongly about this, recoveries that are driven by housing and credit collapses typically take years to recover. Uh, so it, this is, and this is clearly, you know, housing and credit. And so to repair that sense of stability is going to take a long time, um, and which then would lead me to say that I don't see inflation uh, being an issue uh, anytime uh, in the near future, and I would expect that the Federal Reserve we try to be as accommodative on interest rates as possible for as long as they can uh, to try to help us ease the pain of this extended uh, square root or, or bottoming out uh, recovery out there. Now, there is the chance uh, for the worst case, which uh, uh, to me uh, would be uh, pretty uh, uh, terrible, which is the W. And uh, the W really would say that we have, uh, we fall back into a recession, that we, instead of just bouncing along the bottom, that we have this little spike up and then we actually come back down, and probably down deeper and longer than anyone anticipates. And the reason I say that is, as I talk to uh, business leaders and consumers, uh, it, that their ability to digest coming back down are going to make them much more skeptical as to when things are going to recover. And so their confidence in determining about expanding their business, their confidence in terms of going to stores and start shopping, their confidence of, of, of overextending or, or extending themselves out again is going to be something that's going to be much harder to engender if you're in a situation where we fall back down to that, uh, that state uh, of the W. So that, to me, uh, would be a very, very uh, uh, a tough situation for us to recover from. But I think it's a, re a real possibility. And I'll talk at the end a little bit about some of the things that might drive us uh, in, back into that W uh, as we go forward. Now, I'm not an economist, so I'm going to now talk about what I know, which is commercial uh, real estate and how the state of this market uh, has impacted the commercial real estate market. Um, and, and it's really it, it hit the, the commercial real estate market with a combination uh, of four things that um, are the, the prescription for a really bad situation, which is unemployment and commercial real estate being a lagging indicator until employment starts picking up and consumers start spending. Um, the commercial real estate market continues to go down. So you need a recovery to happen. You need people to stop, uh, start hiring and stop firing. And then 12 to 18 to 24 months after that, commercial real estate starts recovering. Um, in addition, we've had property valuations that have dropped dramatically combined with over leverage. So if you go back to that graph where I showed you in, in 2007 when we sold our company, and just to show you, that blue line is us selling the company. That's the, the green line is where our peer group has performed post that. So to put it in perspective, SL Green, the company that bought us, they, their stock was $156 a share when they bought our company. Uh, they went down as low as $8 a share. Um, subsequently, uh, you know, let's say ten, four or five months ago. So up to four or five months ago. So there, and one of the reasons was leverage. What people thought was normal leverage turned out to be abnormal leverage. And it was based on valuations 
that don't exist today. So not only do we have a decline in values, we also have to go through a substantial uh, deleveraging at the same time. And that is going to be very, very difficult. And one of the things that's made that even more difficult is there is almost no credit market available. And I guess the second panel is going to talk about uh, mm. commercial lending and bank lending. Uh, it is a very, very uh, scarce credit market uh, out there. If you look to the graph on the uh, right, hand, like right hand side, you'll see this pie chart. And I don't know if you could read it, but really the big blue piece is commercial banks and savings banks. And the little purple is the commercial mortgage backed security market. So that makes up 75% of the uh, real estate lending that's out there today. 75% by banks that today aren't lending for all intents and purposes. And a CMBS market, which is in non existent, uh, in absolute terms, non existent. And, and you know, just to talk about banks for a second, I think it's, it's interesting. You know, banks um, were, were obviously, uh, and the big topic last year was all the toxic assets that banks had on their books, all the bad loans that banks had on their books, that they had to clear these bad loans <laughs> off of their books before they're going to be able to start lending again. And what happened was, uh, come this spring, uh, first, the, uh, the government went out and they did a stress test of the 19 largest banks to say who was going to survive and not survive. Uh, the Federal Reserve and, and a group of regulators did that. And the at the same time, they did a change in accounting rules on the mark-to-market -market accounting that relaxed those rules so that banks didn't actually have to mark uh, to market the value of their loans based on what the market terms or the market value was at that point. They could take a much longer perspective and say as the markets recover and over a longer term liquidation, what would the value of those loans be? So the combination of those two things uh, provided the banks with the ability to actually avoid having to shed their toxic assets. They're able to actually keep them on their books for a longer period of time. Now, the reason that the regulators uh, did that was because if they did mark those loans to market based on that accounting, almost every bank out there would be insolvent. Um, and so they, there really wasn't a choice. But the byproduct of that is, is that banks aren't shedding their uh, existing loans, so they're not making new loans. And until they can shed their existing loans, and until values get to a point where they can shed those new loans, they're still not going to make uh, new loans along the way. So that's a challenge. And what we're starting to see is on a, a quarterly basis, uh, as banks are making profits, towards the end of that quarter, they look at their real estate book and they say, okay, we have X dollars of profit. Let's take half of our profits, let's allocate it to establish more reserves, and let's try to shed some of our more liquid real estate assets. It's just starting to happen that way. I would say the last quarter was the first quarter I've seen anything meaningful uh, in, the, in that regard. But that's a long process. And this is sort of the fear that many had uh, with Japan when they talk about the lost decade. This is the same concept, which is that you know, it's going to take that long for banks to recover and they're not being realistic of what assets are in their books to ultimately move them off. Um, those are the big banks. The regional banks, the small to medium-sized regional banks, are just beginning to feel it. And they're in, in, in big trouble because they're the ones that were really out there to the local real estate players making commercial loans, um, making construction loans. And if you look at their books of business today, um, it, it's enormously tied to the commercial real estate. As a matter of 800 banks have reported that half of their loans are tied up in commercial real estate right now. 800 banks. So that, that's a pretty extraordinary number. Uh, so far this year, I believe 106 banks have been closed. They're talking between 400 and 600 banks to be closed. It's become every Friday night. I don't know if you saw it. There was a great 60-minute uh, special, how they, you know, they plow in there on a Friday night, but you know, Monday morning and open it up again. That's the process. And again, it's being done thoughtfully. It's being done slowly. Uh, it's being done in a way to try to preserve as much taxpayers' money as possible. But it's going to prolong, ultimately, uh, what happens here. It's not going to be something quick like in the RTC days in the early 90s where they took a bunch of loans and then sold them off to, to the next bidder, something that's happening over time. And one of the reasons is the FDIC doesn't have the money. I mean, the FDIC, two weeks ago, I was meeting with the vice chairman of the FDIC, just came from a board meeting where they realized they were out of money. And they, you know, I don't know how they didn't figure that out beforehand, but they went to this board meeting and realized they were out of money and they had to raise uh, $50 billion. And so they went to all the big banks and they actually charged them FDIC insurance fees three years out so they had to pay them in advance. And again, you know, it's a little bit about uh, you know, trick accounting. So they're paying them in advance, but because of gap accounting, they don't have to actually recognize they're paying them except for those three years. So they write the check day one, so the cash is out of their banks day one, but for the next three years over time, they'll recognize 
the loss of that uh, that 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 revenue um, as an expense there. So you got the the, the, the regional banks are going to be uh, an, a major issue. And I mentioned earlier um, the uh, CMBS market. Um, and uh, when we were here uh, last year having this discussion, we were talking about how the CMBS market had gone from, I think it was like $270 billion in 2007 to about $12 billion in 2008. It's been zero since then. So a, something that makes up 25% of the real estate lending market has produced zero issuance since 2008. Now, they're just starting, we'll talk more about this, through government programs to restart that market, but it's very, very difficult, and it's going to be a, a significant void long-term in the commercial real estate sector about how to uh, bring this together. So, again, you know, in terms of what you think about the outlook, you know, until employment kicks up, until you deal with the fact that there's overvaluation and deleverage and have a market to ultimately go through this, commercial real estate's going to be uh, in a challenged position. Um, and, and, and my sense because of this is it's going to take uh, quite some time uh, to work this through. And again, just, just look at the, on the leverage side, uh, what I've put a slide here just to give you a feel of how it's starting to work its way into the system. So now of the commercial mortgage-backed uh, security, CMBS, that was issued in 2007, 24% of those loans are on the watch list. So those, those 24% have been identified as loans that ultimately have a good chance of defaulting. 16% of all CMBS loans done since 2000 are on the watch list. We in our office have a list of every building in the New York Tri-State area that's on the watch list. They're loans that are on the watch list that ultimately we look at as something that we would target uh, for long term to take advantage of. And as you look at the level of expirations, there's $1.4 trillion of real estate loans that are maturing over the next five years. So you have banks that aren't lending a CMBS market that's broken and a lot of loans that are in bad shape, and we have 1.4 trillion maturing, as you can see in that graph, over the next five years. It's an enormous amount to be dealt with. Now, what most banks are doing, and when you look at the, I was sitting with a, one of the top three banks, I don't want to name which bank it was, recently, and I, you are saying how, you know, the, um, they're not lending at all in private. I said, well, if you look at your, your uh, annual report, your quarterly report, you say you, you lent $12 billion in, uh, in real estate in, the, in that quarter. And I said, well, our definition of lending is we extended loans that were maturing, and we had a couple of lenders that were uh, parties of ours in our loans that went bankrupt that we had to fill their void. So there's no new lending. It's just fulfilling all lending obligations. And that's really the mentality right now. It's, it's kick the can down the street because no one knows how to deal with a problem and hope that we can find some way to create a new lending source or floor devaluations or enough profits to be able to deal with it. And the term that we use in the industry right now is pretend and extend. It used to be you would blend and extend. It's now pretend and extend. Pretend there's no problem and extend the loan. And as long as they're paying interest, you don't actually have to write that out as an impaired assets on your books, and you'll get to go forward. So as long as that borrower can continue to write a check, you're going to pretend there's not a problem, even though you know there is a problem, and you'll extend that loan out, in most cases, for as long as possible. Uh, they say a, a rolling loan gathers no loss. That's the, the line that most uh, bankers like to use. Uh, today. And again, you know, one of the things that you're seeing, by the way, is because interest rates are so low, um, many buildings that otherwise would be clear are underwater aren't yet coming to the surface. And so we call this in, in our operation zombie buildings, buildings that really don't have a life, but until interest rates either rise and they can no longer afford to pay their debt service, or until the loan needs to be refinanced and they're forced to refinance this loan and they can't actually refinance the loan then you'll be in situations where they'll just sit there instead of zombie buildings. Now what happens in that situation is the owners really have no equity value. They're just milking the buildings for every dollar of cash flow they can have, and the lender is really watching their value of their asset get more and more impaired because it's not being managed to grow. So as an example, if you have a zombie building and you have a vacancy and a tenant wants to move in, let's say at 100,000 square feet, you have no incentive to invest in the tenant improvement or pay the brokerage fee to put that tenant in. That could be a $20 million investment or a $15 million investment, depending on what that is. You're not going to put $15 million into a building that you have no equity value in. And you know, I, we gave a little, I gave a little graph here that I think helps illustrate what I'm speaking of. And, and the left-hand side shows you sort of a, uh, let's call it a 2007 acquisition and how you finance it. And then on the right-hand side is currently what the value would be and how you finance it. So assume in this case, 
on the left-hand side, that's a $100 million property that someone bought. And they put 25% of equity and 75% of debt. So they wrote a check for $25 million, and they got a lender to put up $75 million. Now, by the way, in 2007, it probably would have been, they would have put up $10 million, and the lender would have put up $90 million. But let's assume for the moment that there was someone that was a little bit more conservative. If real estate values have lost 40%, that $100 million asset is now worth $60 million. So the original equity is wiped out. Frankly, the back end of most of the debt is wiped out. And now you have to refinance this today and re-equitize it. And that new equity check that's got to be written is probably going to be $20 million by someone new, and you'll get a, a $40 million first mortgage based on today's uh, comp. So the old equity is wiped out, part of lenders are wiped out, and still requires $20 million new equity to create some level of stability. So you can see how painful this is going to be. And again, remember I said there's 24% you know, of the 2007 uh, CMBS is in this situation. That's not even including what's on the bank's book. So this is widespread. And that's one of the reasons that everything is being deferred, because it is so painful and it's going to create such mayhem uh, to ultimately get through it. The other challenge has been the commercial mortgage-backed security uh, business has not been tested to be able to go through restructurings. Uh, back in the early 90s, most of these loans were held by banks. So when loans went bad, you can go to your bank, who had a workout group that they put in place that was pretty sophisticated, and you sat down and you looked at this math and you said, okay, you gotta take a loss, I'll take a loss, I'll invest new money, let's figure it out. In the commercial mortgage-backed security uh, loans that are out there today, there's, you know, there's, there's multiple buildings, tens, twenties, hundreds of buildings in any securitization. So there's not one person you can talk to. You can talk to what they call a special servicer. And the special servicer is for the bondholders in charge of trying to enable them to find ways to maximize value. And sometimes they're proactive. Most of the time, they're not. Um, now, you, there was actually recently a, a, a tax law that was changed by Treasury that changed what they call the REMIC rules. That and one of the things that these uh, more stringent rules were uh, creating was that if the special servicer began to restructure a loan before it was actually in default, before it stopped paying interest or before it couldn't repay its principal, it created negative tax ramifications for the bondholders. They just issued a statement uh, and a clarification that that no longer will create that negative uh, tax implication to the bondholders and they're encouraging special servicers to be more proactive on negotiating these transactions. Uh, we haven't seen it happen yet. I hear about a lot of things out in the marketplace that, that there's a lot of discussions. I guess we'll wait and see but it needs to happen for it to be uh, more proactive. What else has uh, the government done uh, besides changing the REMIC rules to try to address uh, this challenge? Well, first, as I mentioned earlier, they, they flooded the, the marketplace uh, with cheap money, and obviously that helps, um, uh, you know, again, a low LIBOR rate, and a lot of these loans are LIBOR-based loans uh, in the short term, um, enable uh, buildings to be carried at a longer period of time. Construction loans can go longer without having to have interest reserves, reserves uh, replenished. So that obviously is, is, is a positive. Um, they also have been buying securities, they've been buying mortgage-backed securities, uh, which obviously has brought down mortgage rates to some of the lowest level in the history for, this, for the single-family home industry, which again uh, is a positive. Two programs that they put in place under TARP that affect uh, the, uh, the real estate industry. One is TALF and one is the PPIP program. And the TALF program is really uh, uh, focused on trying to create the asset-backed securities market, and it's worked successfully so far on consumer loans. It's worked on student uh, student loans. Um, it has not yet worked on commercial real estate loans. Um, for commercial real estate loans, rather than being three-year issuance, they've actually said you get a five-year issuance, and it's using effectively the Federal Reserve balance sheet as well as using and guarantees as well as using money from TARP to incentivize uh, lending. Now there is. Uh, one large transaction that Goldman Sachs is working on right now that might be the first group to come through um, the, the, the program on TALF and issue CMBS uh, through this program. The big challenge, frankly, is that the appraisals that you need to get the um, investment grade ratings that are required to participate in this program are so challenging uh, that most properties don't qualify in any economic way. Um, and so whether or not it's, wide, it's used widespread, uh, is going to be tested over time. The PPIP program was an idea to, to remove these legacy assets off of the bank's books, the toxic assets. Uh, frankly, it was a, a good idea, 
but it was uh, designed prior to uh, banks having the leniency to not have to have their assets off their books. So they're not necessarily um, uh, incented to sell today like they might have been uh, in the past. Uh, but the theory is to use government leverage and government as a partner to go out and uh, create uh, capital structures so buyers could pay more for those toxic assets and generate opportunistic returns than what a normal person might pay if they didn't have the benefit of that leverage and the government as a partner. It also creates much more liquidity. Um, there's been, I think, nine um, uh, comp firms that have actually gotten PPIP designation and are in the process of raising matching funds to match the government. Um, it will be interesting to see ultimately how this pans out from talking to some of my colleagues at those firms. I don't believe they believe it's going to be as big an opportunity as they had originally thought when they invested so much to get qualified to be a PPIP uh, a participant or, or agent. But we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But in any case, I think these are both positive um, uh, programs um, that will be tested. So I think as you go through and just think how this the, all together comes out, we, we have averted the near-term Armageddon that I spoke about at the beginning, um, and the capital markets have opened because of that, and there's been some confidence level. There's been $20 billion of equity uh, that's been raised uh, in the uh, real estate capital markets in terms of uh, common stock issuance, IPOs, uh, convertible uh, for so companies like SO Green that were on their own watch list, survival list, have actually been able to re equitize their balance sheet and uh, severely dilute the existing shareholders, but ultimately can play for another day and survive. Doesn't mean they have enough to go and do anything proactively, but they, they're going to survive as they go through uh, the process. Because of all the things I said, I think this is going to be sort of a, a slow motion unraveling. Uh, or restabilization of the real estate industry. This is probably a three to five year process for the commercial real estate industry to go through that painful deleveraging, re-equitization, and removal of, uh, of tax assets from, from banks' books. And uh, you know, I think we're going to need new financing vehicles. Uh, we're seeing some being developed. There was just a couple of mortgage REITs that, a few, three mortgage REITs that uh, recently uh, did IPO, Starwood Capital being the largest at a billion dollars. That's positive. Um, as I said, we see the CMBS market open. That would be positive, and if banks start lending, and again, we are starting to see some inkling with some types of transactions that banks will start thinking about lending because of the of the, of the amount of money that they have. But there are more small local banks uh, that are in the process of doing that. As I look at this, though, I really do believe the public markets are going to be leading the way to this reequitization. I don't think there's a choice. I think that there's it's just so much equity is required to ultimately uh, salvage the system that a, a, a private firms, private institutions aren't going to be able to do this. It's going to have to go back to the public markets to achieve this. So let's talk about how it impacts our region and, and starting with New York City. As I said, you know, what's interesting for us is really New York City is really the epicenter of this crisis. It's the Lehman Brothers, it's the Bear Stearns, it's the financial system. This is where it all was formed, where it was all sent out, all the toxic paper, and where all the pain started to come back when the world uh, began to come to an end. And if you look at employment in New York City uh, today, it's the lowest it's been since the early, uh, the early 80s. Um, by the, you know, December uh, 2007, when we began this recession, we've lost about 117,000 jobs. Uh, the forecast is that we'll lose 250,000 jobs uh, in New York City. The unemployment rate's about 9.5% today. Uh, if you look at the availability rate of office space in New York City, it's about 15% and climbing. Um, about a third of that is what we call sublet space, so that's when a, a J.P. Morgan or Barclays is taking space off of their um, uh, portfolio and leasing it out to others, and the balance is held direct. Uh, I will tell you from my discussions with a lot of commercial real estate executives, there's a lot more available space than is actually being marketed. Uh, when you talk to some of these big banks, they'll whisper in your ear, if you know someone who really wants that 400,000 square feet, I'll give it to them, and that's not in the statistics. So that gives me a reason to pause to say these statistics um, are not at a level that would give you a, a sense that they're coming down. They're going up before they come down. Um, the effective rents in New York are down 40 percent, and leasing activity and volume uh, is down 30 percent, although we've seen a little bit of a, an uptick. But again, I think most of that is because people held off and had to hold off uh, during the, uh, the, the period where I think the crisis was at its peak. Just a little case study I included here on, on the right-hand side because I think it helps demonstrate what I was talking about value. This is a building, 1540 
um, Broadway. Uh, it's a, a building right in the heart of Times Square. We actually bid on this building. You see on the bottom side of the slide are the prices where what the building cost and where it's sold the multiple times that it's ultimately traded. We bid in the building in, in around the end of 2003. Uh, at the time, this is prices per foot. We were actually bidding uh, at about $350 a foot. It traded uh, initially uh, at $200 a foot, then at $580 a foot, then $700 a foot, then at $1,600 a foot, then $1,000 a foot, and just recently at $380 a square foot, which, by the way, was overpriced. So it gives you a feel for what's happened. And you know, for those who've been in the real estate business through cycles, what you recognize is you've got to buy it right, you've got to create value, and you have to have the discipline to sell before you hit the other side of the market. And this obviously hasn't been the case. This is one sample of dozens of buildings in Manhattan that saw that spike I was talking about earlier and that are coming way down. Pricing is coming back to the early 2000s, both in rents and in terms of um, pricing for assets, uh, and cap rates and price per foot. And I think that's going to take, again, some time before it reaches uh, equilibrium. That all being said, you know, one of the things that, that we do is uh, we raise institutional capital, raising a, a second distress fund right now, and so I go around the world and I meet with inv investors. And uh, the big thing I always talk about is, you know, as much as New York is the epicenter of this crisis, I'm 100% confident that New York will ultimately come out stronger on the other side. And New York historically has proven uh, to be an extremely resilient economy, particularly Manhattan. I mean, it's part of the global economy. Companies want to locate there. People want to live there. Tourists want to come visit it. It's a magnet for, um, for people around the world and companies around the world. Uh, and it's, while if you go back and look, and still today, the financial service firms are a large part of the New York City economy, over the years it's diversified uh, dramatically uh, between <coughs> entertainment, media, consumer products, consumer services, pharmaceuticals, etc. You have a whole healthcare, a whole group of other industries that are driving the New York economy other than just the financial service firms that had done it uh, historically. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the biggest challenges I think New York had faced uh, back in 05, 06, 07 was it was pricing out companies and people wanted, that wanted to live there. What we saw was a lot of companies that wanted to locate in New York couldn't afford to do so. And one of the things we were doing, we were capitalizing on moving Morgan Stanley to Westchester, moving companies to New Jersey. We were moving companies to Long Island City <coughs> outside of New York because the price to, to do business in New York was too high. There was too, the scarcity of space was too great. Uh, same thing with people living there. You couldn't afford an apartment. That's why you saw Brooklyn and Long Island <coughs> City come together. A young professional couldn't afford to live in New York. One of the byproducts of this downturn is New York has become affordable again to companies that belong there. And we've already seen signs of that great, great uh, uh, signal. Pfizer recently bought Wyeth, um, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, and they actually have uh, Bay Wyeth based in New Jersey. They have about 600,000 feet in New Jersey. Uh, Pfizer was going to be subleasing the space they had on their building at 3rd Avenue, 600,000 feet. They thought they were going to do somewhere in the, the mid-40s per square foot on the sublet. They only can get about $30 a square foot, so they decided instead to taking Wyeth from New Jersey and consolidate them into New York because all, all else being equal, you're better off being in the, under the same roof for efficiency purposes. So there has been a repricing that's now made New York uh, more uh, competitive than it otherwise would be. The other thing that's interesting about New York is it is going to, it has already to some degree, uh, participate in the early signs of this recovery and restructuring phase. I mean, when you think about, people talk about, you know, government uh, incentives and, and, and programs, all that money from TALF and TARP that's generated this level of financial activity and has generated all these different issuance of debt, of equity, of IPOs, of mergers and acquisitions, that's driving New York's economy again. The bankers are working harder than ever, and they're making wide spreads in everything they're doing. So that floating New York, um, floating the, the system with capital, is New York is the, is the lead beneficiary. Look at Goldman Sachs' earnings. Look at J.P. Morgan's earnings. They're the lead beneficiary of that big flooding the system uh, of capital. The second thing that's interesting is when you look at New York, uh, the restructurings that are going on around the country are all coming back to New York. There's only one bankruptcy court in, in, the, in the United <coughs> States that has the technological capabilities to handle a GM, so to speak, and that's the Southern District. And they spent a ton of money on putting in the technology and the systems in place and to get that done. Go look at the law firms, the Wild Gottschalls of the world, the, the, the Scadden Arps. 
That's where they are. It's all coming back to New York. So that, again, is a driver that will help New York um, get through uh, this downturn. So that's the demand side. You know, what's interesting is the other side of the equation is supply. Because when you hear about this real estate bubble and you think about, for example, Southern Florida, I wouldn't really know when Southern Florida ever recovers because you not only need demand to recover, you actually need to deal with the fact that they had so much excess uneconom uneconomical supply that you don't know when that's going to be absorbed, or Southern California, or, um, or, or Arizona. New York's different. New York actually, uh, since 1995 to 2008, actually saw its supply of office space decrease by almost 16 million square feet. Between 9-11, conversions of office buildings to residential buildings, net of what was built, we're actually down 16 million square feet. So it's really seen a, a significant contraction. In addition, by 2010, 60% of the office space in New York City is going to be older than 50 years of age. So think about how much things have changed, how much the way we operate, technologies, air conditioning systems, uh, you know, that has changed over the last 50 years to make those buildings competitive. A lot of these buildings are going to be obsolete without significant capital uh, investments. They're going to invest in, in, and some of them aren't possible. If you don't have the right uh, type of ceiling heights or if you don't have the right uh, span, on the column widths or, or things of that nature, you really can't compete uh, as you go forward. So New York from a supply side, uh, I think is in very good shape and it's very hard to add new supply uh, to New York uh, as you go forward. So between that demand, um, having the chances to come back and the entrepreneurial spirit that always reinvents um, the, the free markets and that constraint on supply, I'm bullish long term on New York even though the pain is gonna be there. And, let me read you a quote that I love, which Dan Doktoroff said, it was in the Times on March 12th, and he says, we are now in the middle of the 12th serious downturn since New York became a major financial center in the early 19th century. The lesson of every single one of these previous 11 busts is that the city always comes back stronger than ever. History is perfect on that one. And I agree with that. That's what I think is going to ultimately happen with New York. Now, I wish I could be as positive for Long Island because I think Long Island has some deeper, more fundamental uh, challenges. Frankly, out of the New York tri-state area uh, surrounding New York City, I think Long Island uh, probably is in, in the uh, worst shape of all of these suburban markets, obviously being the oldest uh, suburban market. But the biggest thing is being able to attract and keep companies here. And I've said this you know, historically at different conferences, but the list keeps getting longer, which is when you go back and look at what drove Long Island past Grumman, was you had these homegrown companies that became large and you had founders that were dedicated to Long Island that decided they were going to stay on Long Island even though the cost of living might be high on Long Island. And they're disappearing from Computer Associates to uh, Norfolk Bank to Arrow Electronics to Symbol Technologies uh, to obviously uh, Grumman, uh, maybe one day Cablevision, uh, from EAB going to city to city not being what city is anymore so as I look at the mix of businesses that are on Long Island, um, they're getting smaller and smaller, and there's no reason for them to be here. We just recently had a, a significant loss, a large pharmaceutical company, OSI Pharmaceutical, one of our uh, fastest growing companies on Long Island, uh, announced they're moving to Westchester. And, and so there's another sign of us not being able to compete to, com to keep companies here. Now, why can't we compete to keep companies here? First, um, you know, we, we're, we're dealing with a tremendous amount of legacy issues. We're losing the key parts of our population. We're losing that up and coming professional who doesn't want to live here anymore. They're moving on and going elsewhere. We're losing our mature population, which are the population with the biggest pocketbook and the biggest spenders that want us that have supported this economy uh, historically. Uh, it's expensive to live on Long Island. Uh, housing prices are five times higher than the average median income. Um, the real estate taxes continue to increase, and uh, there, I don't see any signs of how that's uh, decreasing. If you go to our building, RxR Plaza, to give you just an example, Nassau County, how bad it is, our real estate taxes per foot in that building are $11 a square foot. If you go to our building right across the uh, county line, uh, 58 South Service Road, I saw one of my tents 58 South Service Road here before, there we go, $3.50 a foot. So $11, $3.50, just because of Nassau County has so many legacy issues that it's dealing with that's built up so much debt that that budget's not even negotiable. That's gotta be dealt with. The only way you deal with those real estate taxes is you gotta increase the revenue base to deal with that fixed expense and shrink it down proportionally. And that hasn't happened and that's not gonna happen unless there's growth. Utility rates obviously are high, et cetera. 
And then the quality of life of what made Long Island special uh, it has, has changed and the desire for what people want has changed. You know, you have suburban sprawl, which uh, has taken up a lot of, of, of the open space that used to be out there. There's no distinctive downtown, uh, which is something that's become critical for how people want to live today. Uh, really, where they can live and they can go uh, live someplace, be entertained, shop, work in one location. We have a car-dependent culture, where again, is something that people don't want to necessarily uh, focus on. So th I think that, that that's a, an area that makes it not attractive. And when I'm out talking to, to tenants, and they have a, a requirement to come to uh, a place outside of Manhattan, around the New York Tri-State area suburbs, Long Island's never on the list. We're working with, on a 300,000 square foot. If I told you name, you would say this is a healthy company for years to come, one of the leaders right now in dealing with things that are out there. And they're looking at New Jersey, Westchester, and Connecticut. Long Island can't even get them on the list, and more likely than not, they're going to go to New Jersey. And that's a problem. And uh, so we're losing our homegrown companies, and we're not replacing them unless we find a way to compete uh, in this region, uh, which is why we're pushing so hard for things like the Lighthouse, uh, which in our opinion will be uh, an economic uh, magnet to bring companies back uh, to Long Island. If we had a Lighthouse built, my guess is we would have had OSI Pharmaceuticals as a tenant in our technology center across from what will be the Hofstra Medical School and places for people to live and a lifestyle they ultimately want to have. So let me, let me give a quick conclusion that I'll, I'll answer any questions that anyone uh, might have. So, you know, I, I, as, as you can sort of tell from my perspective that we need a lot more than positive GDP growth, uh, earnings driven by expense reductions, and the recovering equity market to get us out of this uh, uh, mess and get the, economics, the, the economic environment stable enough and the healthy real estate industry to be able to then grow upon that. And so companies need to start hiring. Um, today, when I talk to companies, even if they're doing well, they're not hiring yet. They have not heard the all clear sound enough to get comfortable hiring. In many cases, uh, companies are, are letting people go. Uh, we need to get banks to start lending. And they've got to start using their profits to, you know, just put in, instead of putting up great numbers, take bigger losses and put bigger reserves in place so they can start shedding the toxic assets. Um, we need new vehicles to go fund commercial real estate and deal with that deleveraging I spoke about earlier. And the securitization market needs to get uh, set up. And I think, as I said, TALF uh, has a chance of doing it. We'll see. There's going to be, you'll know, watch carefully uh, this Goldman uh, uh, pool of assets that might be coming to the market over the next uh, couple of months. And I think that will be indicative uh, if that gets going. I mentioned earlier on the W, the near term risk to recovery. And again, um, here's some of these my views. The first is the consumer and, and companies aren't ready to start growing yet. They're dealing with trying to repair their balance sheets uh, and they're concerned and I think that's going to be an ongoing issue. I think oil prices um, is something that has shot up and put another tax on the consumer that wasn't anticipated that again will weigh down uh, our ability to expand. Uh, the federal deficit, which is obviously large and scary, uh, could force interest rates to go up higher then the current economic conditions can survive, can handle. And so that may happen. There's an article in Bloomberg, I think, over the weekend talking about the Treasury now going longer term, uh, trying to push out the longer term uh, the Treasury issuances, and rates are going to go up because of that. Uh, you got small businesses are having a hard time surviving. A lot of these businesses have done everything they can to survive in situations where the lines of credit have been pulled, the customers aren't there. If they're selling, they're selling at almost no margin. And the longer we're in the situation, the harder it's going to be for small businesses uh, to survive. And obviously, they're a big driver of what makes this economy uh, work. The regional banks, as I mentioned, are in big trouble, which has another uh, impact, which is they're usually the banks to the small businesses. So the more that they fall in trouble, the less likely small businesses are going to be able to replace the credit that they need uh, uh, to, to move forward. And then lastly, the, uh, the fiscal pressure that state and local governments on, are going to be under is, is unbelievable. And I, I don't think people have um, really figured out how we're going to deal with that or have really tried to address it. If you think about the reduction in uh, income taxes, the reduction in sales tax, the reduction in real estate tax, the reduction in transaction fees that state and local governments are going to be experiencing uh, for the next 12 to 24 months without a commensurate reduction in cost, because it's very hard to get that commensurate reduction in cost, uh, that's going to be a challenge. And so they're either going to have to let people go or raise taxes um, or get a fiscal, another, another federal stimulus 
bailout to, uh, to support them. So th that's my, my case for what potentially happens to push us into uh, to a W. I'm hopeful it doesn't, um, but uh, these are the things that I think are data points uh, to watch. Uh, thank you very much for uh, letting me share some of my views.